Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here today. We're, we really appreciate your time and your attendance. And um, we're very excited for the conversation with this group of impressive women that are on the stage today. Uh, my name is Jean Flemma. I am the director of a project called the Ocean Defense Initiative. I am the co-founder of the Urban Ocean Lab. And I am also a longtime ocean policy advocate and practitioner. Very, very long time, in fact. Um, Regenerative ocean farming, as many of you may know, offers a wide range of potential climate solutions. Seaweed has the ability to absorb massive amounts of carbon and protect shorelines by reducing wave energy, and Emily is gonna talk more about that. A single oyster, oysters are very impressive. I think we have an oyster farmer here today, or a couple of oyster farmers here. Uh, a single oyster, including Imani, of course. Um, a single oyster can filter up to 50 gallons of water per day, allowing seagrass and other habitats to thrive in that cleaner water. That, of course, helps biodiversity, and it also enhances coastal resiliency. And Kate will talk more about resiliency related to oysters and other natural infrastructure. A regenerative ocean farming also increases food security and creates jobs and supports coastal economies, which Amani and Marina will both talk about. And they will also talk about um, opportunities for advancing what is currently the fastest growing sector of the aquaculture industry. A quick side note, Urban Ocean Lab, as I mentioned, um, is a think tank that I co-founded with Marquise Stillwell, who I think is here. There he is, Marquise, thank you. Um, and we're releasing a policy memo today that was informed by discussions with Emily and several other people in the industry uh, that includes recommendations for local, state, and federal decision makers on advancing regenerative ocean farming. Um, and if you want to learn more about that, you can go to our website and download the memo. But now I'm just going to quickly introduce our panelists, and then they're going to get to the big discussion. So Emily Stengel is the co-executive uh, co director of GreenWave, a nonprofit organization dedicated to training a new generation of regenerative ocean farmers and building the new blue-green economy. It creates jobs, mitigates climate change, and grows healthy food. Amani Black, who I just met today, I'm very excited, um, is an oyster farmer from the eastern shore of Maryland, where I spent a lot of time in my youth, and the founder of Minorities in Aquaculture, an organization that educates minority women about the environmental benefits provided by aquaculture to promote a more diverse, inclusive, and aquaculture industry. Marina, who I also just got to meet today, rock star, is the administrator for the Organized Village of Kassan in Alaska and the program director for the Sustainable Southeast Partnership. Uh, she spends the majority of her time out on the land and the water addressing community needs with sustainable solutions that are based in traditional knowledge. And finally, Kate Orff is the founder of the design firm Scape, the director of the urban design program at Columbia and the first landscape architect to win a MacArthur Genius Grant. I am a huge fan of the MacArthur Genius Grants. I love it when the list comes out every year. I'm always so excited to see who's on it. And so it's exciting for me to be on the stage with somebody that has actually won one. Um, Kate's also an advisor of Urban Ocean Lab. And we've known each other for at least five years. And this is the first time we've met in person. Um, each of them will talk for a few minutes, and then we're going to have a Q&A, and with time at the end for questions from the audience. So with that, Emily. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Jean. It's really an honor to be here on this panel with these amazing women. Um, I do have a slide here. I'd love to start oh. by just showing what. That's oh, that's <laughs> I think it's helpful to get a visual of what a regenerative ocean farm looks like, and at least by our definition, you can see it here on the left. It's just a very simple infrastructure, underwater, ropes, buoys, anchors, from which we grow native species of shellfish and seaweed. So I've been in this industry for uh, about 10 years, and prior to that was doing work in land-based food systems, really seeing um, multiple crises at work, right? The land access crisis, water, nutrient crises, and sort of wondering how we could help producers to make, continue to make a living producing food. Um, and then I joined forces with Bren Smith, my co-founder at GreenWave, who comes out of the commercial fishing industry and remade himself as a regenerative ocean farmer. He's got his own farm off the coast of Brantford, Connecticut in Long Island Sound. And Bren was really uh, concerned with trying to figure out how he could continue to make a living on the ocean. So we came together and really saw regenerative ocean farming as a solution to help folks 
diversify in the face of you know, warming waters, less lobsters coming in the waters of Maine, no lobsters showing up in Long Island Sound anymore, um, and really seeing regenerative ocean farming as sort of a just transition solution in this era of climate change. So we launched Green Wave eight years ago to, as Jean said, train and support a new generation of regenerative ocean farmers. We're a national organization. We've got farms in Connecticut and California that we run, but we also support a national network of farmers. And we do that in a couple of ways by providing training and support services. So this is through in-person technical trainings, also through our online ocean farming hub where we provide a seed to sale curriculum and tons and tons of resources for anybody who could ever want to figure out how to start an ocean farm and run an ocean farm. We also provide climate subsidies. This is really paying farmers to farm through our Kelp Climate Fund program. We do work in market development, making sure that our farmers have a place to sell their crops at the end of the season. And we also do work in infrastructure, so making, making sure that there's land-based infrastructure in place to support farmers like seed production, like dockside stabilization, so that they can capture you know, maximum value from that supply chain. Thank you. Amani, would you like to? I think, oh, Thanks. I didn't turn it off. Okay. <laughs> um, hi, everybody. My name is Imani Black. Um, I'm super excited to be here today. This is my first time ever coming to this conference. And so meeting all of these lovely ladies uh, again and also in person for the first time is really amazing. Um, I am the founder and CEO of a nonprofit called Minorities in Acre Culture. Um, but before that, I had a six-year commercial oyster farming career uh, before 2020, working on the Chesapeake Bay. Um, I In 2018 to 2020, I was the assistant hatchery manager for the first privately owned shellfish hatchery in the state of Maryland. Um, so I have all experience in hatchery, nursery, and farm. I've run uh, a hatchery before, but I've also been on a commercial boat uh, getting oysters, getting cages in the middle of winter when it's snowing and sleeting and there is no heating system at all on the boat. Um, and so then in 2020, um, you know, I really saw the lack of diversity in aquaculture, culture and then also just really realized that aquaculture culture is so important that uh, we shouldn't really be looking at, you know, who from what background is getting into it. Everyone should just know where their seafood is coming from. So originally I had never worked with another woman of color before in a leadership role. And so I kind of was out on this quest to find other women of color. Um, and that's how Minorities in Acre Culture got created. And so over the last like two and a half years, it's really exploded and we've gotten a lot of really great support from the aquaculture culture industry um, and a lot of other fisheries industries, um, not only to be able to provide career development resources for women of color, um, and also to realize that women of color are not um, are a double minority, but there's other underrepresented demographics within aquaculture culture that we want to represent. Um, so through our internship program, um, really starting to mitigate some of the barriers that uh, minorities face trying to get into fisheries. So lack of resources, lack of funding, um, lack of network, things like that. Uh, we have over 120 members from all across the, the country and a few internationally that we connect with um, and engage with regularly to help them make connections within the aquaculture culture industry to build their own uh, way into aquaculture culture because right now aquaculture culture isn't just about farmers and producers and things like that but it's other disciplines that can come in and really enhance this industry um, but also we have a really big cultural piece too I firmly believe that aquaculture culture cannot be ecologically beneficial without it being culturally beneficial and having underrepresented demographics we we have to look at the history of their engagement in traditional commercial fisheries and see aquaculture culture as a new wave of that commercial fishery. So really recognizing historically why uh, certain demographics aren't in aquaculture culture or fisheries right now. Um, and really it's because, you know, they're a fading kind of demographic. For example, there's only nine active black captains in the Chesapeake Bay currently still living. And they're all of the age of 60. Oldest is 84 with no younger generations coming behind them. Um, so by engaging with the, those black captains, I really got a sense of what they were longing for in continuing their legacy because they know that once they retire, that legacy is over. Um, and African-Americans only 
the Chesapeake Bay will not be involved in fisheries at all. And so through our program, Minorities on Course, we're working with those black captains, bringing in um, you know other African Americans to get their captain's license, to have careers on the water, but then also really recognizing that early education engagement, really meeting students where they are, um, fifth grade, sixth grade, even younger, and really um, having a range of engagement um, until they're able to uh, pick a, a marine occupation. So, um, so yeah, I, I think minorities in aquaculture has really exploded over the last two and a half years because people see the need for diversity in fisheries. But for us, it's not just about the diversity and equity and inclusion pillar. It's, again, about people should just know where their seafood is coming from. And aquaculture is too important for everyone not to know about. So yeah. thank you. Thank you. Uh, the aging of the fleet and then also the lack of diversity of the fleet is such a complex issue so it's really interesting and it's just yeah. a copy and paste yeah. you know chesapeake bay is just a i mean we just right. talked about this it's a copy and paste from all over the world so it's something that we're really trying to address as yeah. we get bigger amazing um marina yeah um and i do have some slides oh, yeah. as well Thank um you. Uh, marina anderson uh, Kaigani Yari Ayahat, Mary Bell Di Nanu Ijin, Robert Kennedy Di Chenu Ijin, James Anderson Di Hat U Ijin, Forrest Anderson Di Au Ijung, Di Uk Eat Hut Agung, Prince of Wales Islands Tul Ijung. Um, in short, I just said hi. Um, <laughs> my name is Marina Anderson and I come from Prince of Wales Island. My home villages are Hinya Kwan and Hau Kan and um, I'm both Haida and I'm Tlingit. My Tlingit people have lived on um, the island that I live on for uh, 11,000 years according to Western science. The um, oldest fish trap, fish weir in the world was just found um, in the ocean right where uh, my village resides, um, dating back to 11,000 years. And so I imagine that we'd been there at least a few thousand years prior to that so that we could learn the migration of the fish and we could create this system to be able to sustainably harvest for our people and, and, and keep our people thriving in one place for such a long time. My Haida ancestors come up from Haida Gwaii, which is in um, British Columbia. Uh, prior, it was known as the Queen Charlotte Islands and um, we canoed up in the, in the early 1800s. And in my slides, you saw some photos of um, these are some of the people that I get to work with in Southeast Alaska. My bio is a little bit off. I used to be the executive director of my tribal government, um, but I am no longer the executive director of my tribal government. I am now the director of a collective impact network in Southeast Alaska called the Sustainable Southeast Alaska, or Sustainable Southeast Partnership. Um, my favorite thing about this is I get to spend a lot of time with the community members in all of the villages with um, the people that are from there and that live there and I get to work with them on creating sustainable economies and reclaiming the economies that have been placed on top of us. Southeast Alaska historically um, relied heavily on old growth logging. We have a strong fishing industry which is the leader in our economy but old growth logging in the timber industry was right below that. So for decades we had been um, literally mowed over and with that, we weren't able to grow a proper workforce. A lot of our people were displaced, and a lot of education was lost. And so in those first photos, what you're seeing is um, spending time in the communities with people who are relearning how to um, uh, harvest different things like gumboots from the beach and how to traditionally process the, that. Uh, it's a little bit controversial, but I included it for a reason. There's a photo of chopped up seal meat and um, seal intestines. That's our sustenance and that's our food. That's also our spiritual connection to the people that came before us and the way that we connect with the land. Um, here you can see I am in the communities with some children where we went out to, I went out and tried to get a halibut so I could show the kids how to process and traditionally preserve a halibut uh, to share out with the community because that's how our economy really operates on a basis of sharing. And unfortunately, there was no halibut to be caught at the time. Um, we experienced a lot of overfishing. But there's kelp. There's always kelp. Mm -hmm. And so what did I do? 
filled up a boat full of kelp, brought it back to the community, and we made pickles and salsa and, and relish, and the kids just ate it straight up. In, um, there's this little boy in the middle picture, Matthew, and he kept saying, I didn't know you could eat bull kelp. <laughs> But he did know the traditional uses, other traditional uses for bull kelp, like using the bulb of that kelp to actually transport and hold seal oil. Mm -hmm. So it's really interesting to have those conversations with adults, but also the youth who are reclaiming and relearning a lot of these things. With the Sustainable Southeast Partnership, we don't just work in Ocean's Health. We work all in all areas that we see have a need in Southeast Alaska. We work in habitat restoration, oceans health, energy independence, regenerative tourism, cultural vitality, you name it, we're doing it in Southeast Alaska. And that's not because our organization has these ideas that we're imposing on the communities, but the way that we operate is we bring unrestricted funds to the communities and provide a support through a network. And with those unrestricted funds, the communities set their priorities and they do the projects at the speed that they know they need to do them in. They have the right resources, and in Southeast Alaska and in every region, we have the right resources to reach um, not just sustainability, but regeneration, because we don't want to be sus sustaining to where we're at right now. We want to actually be a regenerative economy. And those ideas come from the inside out. Every community knows what they need, and they have the tools. And if they don't have every single resource, that's where they lean into this collective impact network and we're able to link the people up with the resources and with the money. And something that has been a, a really big goal of mine lately is to raise funds for a trust that we set up. We're kind of changing the way that philanthropy works and we have created a trust that will essentially fund the work of the Sustainable Southeast Partnership in perpetuity so that our communities aren't tied to grant stipulations and deliverables that don't make sense and timelines that don't work. We do what we call operating at the speed of trust. And sometimes that's really slow. It's like a federal contract. It's going to take forever. There's not a lot of trust there. And it's going to take a while before you actually touch that pen to the paper. But sometimes that trust goes really quick. And with like somebody like Imani, this trust has already been established. We met five minutes prior to this panel starting. But there's an inherent trust that I have with Imani. So if Imani wanted to work on a project with me, boom. We would have that thing out the door, and it would be flourishing very quickly. So with our network, we, we have a lot of people with like the Department of Agriculture, NGOs, tribal governments. Ten years ago, you would never see those three sitting down in a room together, let alone working on solutions together. And it's because we've cultivated this network where we have hard conversations. We talk about history with, with first contact, we not only acknowledge but empower the local indigenous people to be the leaders and we operate off of indigenous values in the region. Thank you for having me and it's great to be here today. Thank you and can we get the recipe for kelp pickles? <laughs> Come to me for all, all recipes. Right, all right. We'll make beach pesto, we'll make all right, beach kimchi. Excellent, excellent. Thank you. Um, and finally, Kate is going to, okay. let me see if Good I have morning. the slides right. Yes, there we thanks. go. Thank you. Okay. Um, my name is Kate Orff. I, I am registered as a landscape architect. I, I would just say this, bris this makes me bristle because this is frankly the farthest thing of what I'm actually trying to do, which is essentially lead and, and help um, facilitate community-driven water-centric transformations <laughs> of places. So um, this is, um, so I have a, a design office called SCAPE uh, based in New York, New Orleans, and San Francisco, and also I'm teaching at Columbia trying to advance sort of new forms of education around climate uh, and society and design. So this is just an image of a, a, a project called Oyster Texture, which is from 2009, and I will just say that it, part of what it's kind of trying to point towards is just a reset of this relationship between people and the waters that sustain us. Um, in New York City, uh, our um, oyster population is at 0.01% of its historic ex extents. Just to say that, um, you know, we can you know, all value that condo that looks out over the water to increase the value of our condo. We can, you know, but 
these, the waters are, are in deep trouble and the life that has sustained us and that exists under these waters are in, and within these waters are, are in profound trouble. So this was an idea about kind of reclaiming the watery, rich, thick, mosaic nature of the ecosystem that helped sustain uh, the city of New York in its early days and try to hit the reset button around uh, bringing back uh, uh, life-giving reefs that can slow the water, clean the water, and also help uh, our shores from eroding and help us prepare better for a climate-changed environment, which is, as we all are aware, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of increasing storms uh, and uh, 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 um, uh, rising water levels. So next slide. So after Superstorm Sandy hit the region, uh, we had the opportunity to work with some modest federal funding to actually build uh, a structure that can support oyster life uh, called Living Breakwaters. So this is off the, sh the coast of Staten Island in Raritan Bay. And so the idea here is also, I'm so thrilled to be on this panel with these amazing women and, and, and something uh, Marina just said about culture and, and traditional knowledge kind of really struck me very hard because, you know, these this place that you're looking at First of all, there was a wild, massive natural reef here called the Great Reef as part of New York's environment. And after that reef was uh, harvested, this was also um, a shallow shelf where uh, marine, uh, where oysters and mussels were grown. So, you know, if we're talking about this concept of like first nature, which I think, as Marina said, you know, it was always about cultivating. There were weirs on the Chattahoochee River. This, there was a kind of a human nature kind of, you know, uh, a, a, you know, a symbiosis. But what happened is that that nature did not uh, was not annihilated in that process. But we have annihilated uh, many of our the 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 the, the, the creatures and the marine life uh, that have once sustained us. Next, so. Um, the point of, of what I hope this project can do is kind of project forward some of these new ideas about a more, for lack of a better word, urban nature, a nature that we sustain, a nature that we grow, a nature that we cultivate, that we steward. Um, and this uh, project uh, and the breakwaters themselves are, are seeded with oysters in collaboration with the, the, building, the Billion Oyster Project, and we have uh, seven uh, high schools and middle schools on the shore of Staten Island that are participating in this oyster uh, 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 regeneration and risk reduction project next. So um, what's nice is that uh, we even after just it's about 60% through construction, but I do feel like this is signaling, we hope, you know, a different way of thinking about the humans and the natural world, something that's uh, more um, uh, loving, that has more care, that has stewardship embedded in it, um, and that um, acknowledges that we live in a climate-changed world, but that the that things that got us here are not the same tools that will get us out of this mess. The tools are very different. They're what <laughs> Imani, El El Emily, and, and Marina just described. Um, and so um, I'm hoping that, you know, this concept of aquaculture, we can think about it much more broadly, like putting culture, pu putting culture in the center and not just tacking climate as a modifier onto things. It's not climate finance. It's not climate school. It's like truly this sort of regenerative vision uh, that what uh, these ladies have just described. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, can we snap for that? Like, yeah. yeah. Yes, honey. <laughs> uh, well, that's actually a great segue into um, talking about all of you touched on the idea that, um, one, historically, in, case, in some cases, thousands of years, this, these activities have been happening. They're cultural. They're historical. Um, they have not only the benefit to, the, you know, the sort of the climate benefits we talked about, but they also have the ability to restore communities or support communities. And you all alluded to this in different ways, but I'd be curious to know, what kind of investment do we really need to sort of do this at scale where communities are, I mean, you, re you need to recruit people, you need to train people, we need to provide the resources to get through the permitting process, all of the things. So. I would be curious to hear um, from each of you and what what kind of investment do you think we really need to bring this at scale to what 
to meet the challenge that we face, but then also to meet the needs of communities, um, if you want to talk about that. And um, I will say, I, I asked this question in another panel that I was moderating several months ago, and the responder said $100 million. Mm -hmm. So feel free to say what you think is the right amount. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, I'll take $100 million, hands down. But um, no, I mean, we, as an organization, I, I mentioned we are providing climate subsidies to folks who are farming. We think that that is an essential form of investment at this moment to get more farms in the water faster. Um, Everybody is obsessed with blue carbon and trying to figure out a blue carbon methodology. It's just taking too long. We don't have the time to wait for policy and markets to catch up. We need more farms in the water now. Um, and so we're paying farmers to farm. So Subsidizing is, is one form of investment that I think is critical. We would love for the government to support subsidies in that way, but for now we're doing that philanthropically. Um, I do think that there is a role for private investment um, in, in the space, but Maureen and I were talking about this last night. Um, I, it needs to be driven by the communities. So it needs to be community revolving loan funds that are um, based around the actual needs of that particular community. We're seeing vehicles like um, no interest loans or completely forgivable loans working really, really well. This is a natural solution. These uh, investments need to be more patient. They need to have a higher appetite for risk than your traditional investments. So to Kate's point, like this isn't climate finance. This is a whole new form of, of funding the earth. Yeah, I would say that um, one way that we can really invest is really reshaping how we view ecological knowledge, traditional ecological knowledge. Um, it's not considered hard science. Um, and that is where we lose communities because communities are uh, really uh, rooted in their, like we were saying, culture, but also in their value and perception of their resources. And so by understanding how they speak about their resources, how they value their resources, and how they view themselves interacting with those resources is how we can invest in their future. Um, you know, another way, you know, that we can uh, do that is, you know, there's multiple, there's millions of different programs that are out there that are great, um, but then, you know, they're a one-size-fits-all type of type of deal. Um, when I look at a, say, let's say, oyster program, I know that I can't approach that program and that education the same way in a coastal community with children as I do in an inner city. Because I know it is, in an inner city, they're not going to they're not going to have that spark every single day to want to indulge in that topic. But coastal communities, they've seen the water, they've probably been on the water. So in inner city, I have to meet them where they are and say, well, what do you know about your environment, and have them see themselves in their everyday environment and then we can build off of that. Um, it's the investment in time, it's the investment in education, it's the investment in communities just in general about what they need and how science can really help them instead of science being kind of on the side of hard science and being like, well, communities you know, don't really have um, the education to really understand what's going on in science. But science is for everyone. Science is for the community, so it is our job as a scientific community to make it so that our scientific communication is palatable for our communities to understand and really have importance in. Yeah, everything that they said, plus, <laughs> plus just a little bit more. Um, you know, my background is actually in, in tribal policy and with tribal governments, a lot of the money that we access, uh, are their federal grants. And over the years, I noticed that that was not just, um, it, it wasn't just not helping us, it was actually holding our communities back from moving forward. A lot of times you kind of um, burn your bridges by getting a grant and maybe not being able to perform the deliverables that are attached to that grant because you don't have enough people in the community at that time or, or in a community as small as Kasan, which is a community that I've lived in, with 50 people, when there's one death in the family or two deaths in a year, that flips the whole community upside down, and that's what we're taking care of. We're taking care of each other, making sure there enough there's enough food on the table, making sure that those kids are taken care of, that a mourning widow is taken care of properly in the way that we do it, and so that can completely flip the plans for the village for for the year, and it could restrict them from being able to receive those funds again. What we really need is um, unrestricted investments. Um, I spoke a little bit about the Seacoast Trust. Our main reason for setting up the Seacoast Trust was so that we could get those you know, philanthropic dollars invested into that trust 
so that we can keep accessing these funds to, to dish out to our communities. Again, we're not telling these communities what to do. They're telling us what they're going to do, and they're performing. They're performing at a very high speed. We're turning a dollar into ten dollars in southeast Alaska with the way that we're able to operate with this collective impact network. I'm sure most of you have heard about the prices in southeast Alaska, but so when you can turn a dollar into ten dollars, that's incredible in a region like we have. And when we're investing in our communities the way that we are it, with the Sustainable Southeast Partnership, what happens is those communities are starting to foster this education with their children. They're starting to turn into the community to be able to grow the workforce that's needed to actually be able to perform these kelp farms. Uh, a, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, all education, you had to leave the community to receive any. Um, some of our communities just got off dial-up internet. I'm not sure if half of this room might not even remember or know what dial-up internet is, but I tell you, it makes the worst not good. sound when you pick up the landline. <laughs> the Dell desktop thing, yeah. So, you know, we're, we're, we're in, a, in a different place in Southeast Alaska, but that's not specific to Southeast Alaska. You see this on a lot of our reservations. You see this in different places in rural Alaska and northern Alaska where the access to technology, we're just now starting to catch up and we're just now starting to be able to keep our people in the communities and start educating them from the communities. And I can attest to how hard it is to be, um, you know, somebody who's trying to leave to get educated to try to come back. Oftentimes, people leave and they come back, there are no jobs available because we haven't created those jobs. Or somebody would leave the community to get educated and then, in, like in my, my case, my father passed away while I was at university. I had to come home and take care of my family. There was no other option. When my father left, that was our main hunter, the main fisherman, not just for my family, but for our entire community. And people need to eat, and we need to eat our food. And we need to be out on the water and out on the land. And so making sure that we're able to invest in the communities and meet them where they're at, like Imani said, is the most important thing. And not to control what the communities are doing, but to let them have control over themselves. And this needs to be in a way where we're investing in local indigenous um, practices. And so if the people are, are local indigenous people, they need to be consulted with, they need to be engaged with. If any of these businesses are not indigenous led, they better be operating with indigenous values because they are on somebody's land and they are on somebody's waters. And that is so important because when you, when you are able to have everybody operating on the local indigenous values, everybody's on the same page and nobody's in it for themselves. It's all to make sure that we have this land and we have this water for the next generations to come. And it sounds so cliche to talk about seven generations down the line, but it's so selfish just to think about ourselves. Thank you. <laughs> no, Did you I, want to add to that? Sure. I, okay. I was trying to think about like what what do communities need? I mean, I don't know. I feel like my my particular role and then maybe the role of many people <laughs> here is, you know, I kind of think of myself as like a midwife, right? It's like what what can the community express? What are the needs? You know, is it direct funding? Is it a plan so that neighbors can agree with neighbors around, you know, practices or or or, uh, or etc. So I, I almost feel like my job as a spatial designer thinker, uh, it would be to kind of like translate that into kind of a physical form or a document that can be shared. So, so that's just sort of one one thing because I do feel like, you know, moving <laughs> moving moving forward, um, we. I, your story about um, the no halibut, <laughs> you know, and or the no oyster, or is is so so powerful to me because, I mean, we are proceeding as if everything is fine. I.e., the environment is a backdrop in which we live, right? And we're moving about in a landscape with planted trees, etc. But that environment is not a backdrop anymore. We have profoundly changed it. The water chemistry has changed. The species. You know, think about the manatee. Here in 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 South Florida, um, it's it, it's it's not something where we can kind of like keep going on what we're doing. So I, I I definitely feel like communities at the scale of 
community water and practices, there's just a very powerful unit of change there where different scales of change have sort of not really been functional. There is a powerful scale uh, and a transformation scale that exists. So I would just hope that we could begin to sort of advance that scale of change rather, and you know, of course we need federal action to limit nitrogen pollution. We need federal and global action to reduce carbon emissions, etc. But what's happening, as you can see here, is this level of, of neighborhoods tied to an immediate scale of landscape that is about love, care, practices, cultivation, and, and regeneration. So I would only hope that there's a lot of room in this next decades for supporting this kind of work and this scale of change. Yeah, and in fact, um, talking about the scale and federal grant making or federal, what federal government needs to do, as somebody who worked in federal policy for a very long time, I can attest to how slow it is and how um, challenging it is to change the way federal policy is implemented, the way, and Marina referred to this, you know, the height, the way grants are given and the structure is, it's not, it's not adaptive and it, it hasn't adapted in a way that it needs to. And I feel like what you were just saying, Kate, about the need for scale, each of you sort of works in a place, but really what we need is for what you're doing to be scaled and connected to the other communities that have the same challenges and want to do those same things. And I'm wondering if that's already happening, if you're feeling like not just in this panel, obviously, but are you, I, I know all of you are on the road all the time, it seems like, talking to, uh, to other people about what you're doing. And I'm, I'm wondering if that scale is happening now despite Excuse me, don't, despite the federal government? Is this a safe space? I don't know. But um, <laughs> despite, you know, the way the system works and how that's happening and how could philanthropy, how could investors, how could the government help that scale that you're talking about in terms of the way you connect with people, if that's something that you want to talk about? Yeah, yeah I can. Um, for us, you know, um, I... The limit of what I can do is based on my capacity. So I am the only person that we need is ten of you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I need I need funding to make sure that I have a team that is full of doers that wants to do it. Um, I really have cultivated a network of women of color that really see the vision. I've connected, you know, with partners that really see the vision, but they're all like, it's just you. And I'm like, yeah, it's been just me for two and a half years. And imagine, you know, what I've done over that two and a half years, imagine what we could, what minorities in Acre culture could do with just a team of four. Um, because I do see, I mean, I've seen from the very beginning that um, the Chesapeake Bay is just a starter. Um, you know, it's just an area where I can get the structure down, the template down. I can show all y'all that it works. <laughs> and then I, and then I can I already have places that um, I know are going through the exact same things. The Gilligichi community in South Carolina, the exact same thing. Um, that uh, legacy is actively dying way quicker than the Chesapeake Bay. Um, and there are people in other organizations that are really pouring into that community but um, as far as aquaculture, culture, no one that is involved that's in the Gilligichi community is involved in aquaculture, culture. And there is six aquaculture culture farms just on their road. So talk about trust. You know, they, they walk by it every day. But do they have enough of that trust to be able to walk onto that farm and say, hey, like, you know, can I learn about this? Or, hey, can I work here? Or whatever. So that's where minorities in aquaculture culture can, can really stand. It's like going into those communities and say, do you even know what's happening in your community? You don't, let's take you there. Like, let's help you understand so then you can go back and tell your community members about it in your language. You know, it's just facilitating those things. So, yeah, no, um, investors, if you want to invest in minorities Here in aquaculture. Here she is. Here she is. <laughs> I'm, ready to take, I'm ready to take this global, so. <laughs> yeah, this is a really exciting question, um, in my opinion. <laughs> um, also, if you are looking to invest, we'll both take some money, yeah, I think, yeah. right Everybody now. Everybody here wants it, but, yeah. Um, <laughs> with the Sustainable Southeast Partnership, we have some really exciting things going on right now. Southeast Alaska, there are, it's just moving. There's just so much happening. And one thing is, is recently there were um, protections restored on 9.8 million acres of the Tongass National Forest. 
if you know me, uh, I've been very loud for the last, you know, since 2018, um, talking about the Tongass National Forest and the importance of protecting that forest. Um, that forest is directly related to the ocean. The, you know, salmon come up, it, it, it's completely cyclical, it's beautiful. The branches from the trees literally touch the, the kelp forest. That's how connected these two forests are. They aren't even separate. That's just one forest and one happens to be covered in water. Um, so the, the protections were restored on the Tongass National Forest, but of course, the question was, what are we gonna do with the economy? Because the, in Southeast Alaska, as I had stated before, we relied heavily on old growth timber harvesting for our economy. Now, arguments I made was that that was not really a money maker in the recent years, and it was costing the federal government $25 million in taxpayer dollars a year. So really it wasn't making much money and it actually wasn't employing many people anymore. But we still had to prove that that we could sustain ourselves, that we could be a booming economy and a diverse economy in Southeast Alaska without that legacy logging. And so we created a plan for that. And we said, give us money, invest into our region and we will show you how we're gonna diversify this economy. Our people will come up with the ideas to show you how we're gonna diversify the economy. So the Southeast Alaska Sustainability Strategy Initiative was created and that was a $25 million investment from the Department of Agriculture into Southeast Alaska and that's money that we're deploying across the region. Um, different organizations and people submitted for um, projects for the, we call it the SAS, um, the, the Southeast Alaska Sustainability Strategy and those projects are funded and they, they're everything from um, you know, working with small mills or, or small businesses. Some communities are, are building traditional smokehouses. Some communities are uh, working in mariculture and, and developing kelp farm plans. And so we are actively diversifying our economy with that tiny investment of $25 million that's gonna last over the next five years. And what's really exciting about this investment is that it's not a one-time investment. We've changed the way that the Department of Agriculture is actually operating in Southeast Alaska. And instead of all of us in this room, if you're from America, instead of us paying for the, this logging to be happening and actually devastating the ecosystem, we have an investment into these communities where they are diversifying the economy and thriving and doing things that enhance the ecosystem and en enhance the communities and the cultural vitality and the health of the people and the mental health. So it's absolutely incredible to see that investment and to be kind of on the inside of it and watching everybody thrive and everybody feeling empowered. And this conversation is leading out farther than the Department of Agriculture. Now they're wanting us to model this with other departments and to model this with other regions in the country. And I think that we'll be modeling this around the world. Something that's really important with the way that we operate is that we find all of our friends and all of our foes and get everybody sitting down together to work together. That's really what we have to do in our communities is we have to lean into each other. Can you come to Congress yeah. and do that? So I value my mental health. <laughs> I very much value my mental health, but I'll always be there to tell Congress what I think yeah. they should do. But that, I mean, that's exactly what I was thinking is that that is a model now that it's going to be modeled outwards, which is yeah. really, really interesting. And that kind of pivots me to one last question, and then we want to give a few audience questions. But Kate, I wanted to ask you, um, the project that you're currently doing in Staten Island um, with uh, the Living, Wa Living Waters, have you been hearing from other coastal cities that are interested in potentially doing something similar? Because I feel yeah. like that's also a model for, right. yeah. What's, what's interesting, I think, there is that there's a, there's a replicable scalar concept here. It's not, just about, it's not just about the city and its immediate environment. It's about hitting the reset button and establishing what our title is, cultivating coastlines. It's establishing a framework and a funding framework in which schools are being funded through this. The physical infrastructure and the healing sort of landscape is being funded. The risk reduction is being funded. So I would say the replicability of this concept lies in that interconnection of we're not thinking about segregated things. We're thinking about how this system of living breakwaters is enhancing and like enriching 
uh, uh, folks on, on shore and the kind of rebuilding this coastal, coastal culture. And so two other thoughts on, on scale and is that right now, I think we should all agree that the scales that we're thinking about climate, like my individual life and the globe are truly sort of not working, right? We have like sargassum <laughs> seas out, you know, we have, we have massive hypoxia in the Gulf. Like there is just a kind of truly a collapse scenario uh, in terms of our water bodies. So the scales that are working, I think are, are these, these middle scales. We need to hit all scales, but I do feel like this kind of cultivating coastline um, concept is really something that we need to advance. Another quick idea about scale is um, education, right? So part of our, our funding is going to the Billion Oyster Project and specific schools on Staten Island where they're learning science-based education, but learning chemistry, water, aquaculture, small boat handling skills, et cetera, uh, uh, through, through this program, right? So I think we could imagine transforming our secondary education systems to be very much about um, uh, uh, celebrating, adapting, healing, stewarding, and restoring the environments, whether that's a forest, whether that's a, an oyster reef, or whether that's an orchard, you know, is would be would be very exciting. So I think we have to kind of think about the systems at play also in the United States, you know, government, whether it's schools or others that, that could be kind of re, re, reset to really do a broad scale kind of um, uh, neighborhood and, and community-driven uh, projects like this. Thank you. Um, we have time for a few questions from the audience. And Libby over here has the microphone. So if anyone has a question, anybody? And, oh, there we go. <laughs> if you want to say who you are and where you're from, that'd be great. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much for that lovely um, discussion. My name's Chris Cabrera. I'm based out of Oahu in Hawaii. And um, I have a, a group of young people that are always asking me how they can help, right? And you, you spoke earlier when you were setting the stage that this is an extremely, um, this sector of the market is scaling very quickly, right? And so the people in this room, you had a chance to touch on investment, but what can they do to help uplift your work? And also, um, outside of maybe just making it their life's work, is there another way that everybody in this room can make sure that your solutions get scaled quickly in coming years and those of the people who are working on solutions that are not in this room? Sure, I can start. Um, I think for um, youth, it's about telling their parents about this kind of thing. I mean, it's just general education and literacy at this point, like helping people to understand that this is a thing, it's a solution, it's a career path, it's a thing they can support with philanthropic dollars, it's where they can put their money at the grocery store. You can look for you know, local brands of seaweed produced domestically. There's seaweed kimchi in my grocery store, there's dried kelp noodles in my grocery store, and I live in central Pennsylvania, so most of you who are living in more exciting places probably have access to amazing food, you know, more amazing food than I do. So it's really about um, supporting the industry with their dollars so that you know farmers can increase their supply knowing that they'll be buyers on the other side to meet that demand. Yeah, I think for our efforts, um, you know, we, we've kind of shifted from like donors to the language now champions because I think champions like really signifies like what really advocating, supporting and educating people about what we're doing really is all about. Um, I think just letting people know that there are sustainable seafood options out there. Um, one of the things that I like to tell students is learn about like where your local seafood is coming from. You know, learn about like where your you know resource, even if it's like frozen fillets at the grocery store, there are ways that you can read the label and like understand where your food is coming from, track it to make sure that you're making more sustainable choices for you. Um, I think, you know, that just in general, just because I understand that awkward culture is that important that everyone should just know where their source is coming from. That's what I would say is like really helping them get educated on how could they can tell if they're eating a, a sustainable seafood resource or if they're not. Yeah. And on, on top of that, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of youth are on social media and they're really good at it and they're good at telling stories and, for me to be able to share something on social media, I have to put in actual research into how to post this on Instagram so people are gonna see it. 
it takes some time. It's almost it's more than a research paper at this point. But but the younger people are really good at it. We had a TikTok conversation earlier, and we're I'm not on TikTok, but other people are. And so if they're able to share what we're doing and be able to reach each other to be able to kind of create that global conversation, that I think is very, very helpful. The you know funny dancing raccoon videos, those are great too. But if they can share what we're doing in, in these areas with aquaculture, mariculture, that's really gonna be helpful for, for us in the end. Um, with the, the Sustainable Southeast Partnership, there's me, the director, and then we've got a whole comms team and storytelling team because that's how po important it is to be able to tell those stories. Kind of realize that a lot of our work was just happening, but nobody knew about it, and so we weren't able to pull other people into that work. So that storytelling is very, very, very important, I think. I, I was just trying to think about, well, I, I don't know if it hits to the generational question, but I do feel like, to me, this landscape or seascape is, for lack of a better word, is something that we've we've lost. Like we make land use decisions. There's privatization. There's private property. There's a you know plans for raising roads, etc. But there's not a kind of a series of interconnected visions about how to sustain living, thriving, physical landscapes. <laughs> In, in, in the United States, like it just simply doesn't exist. There are master plans for different segregated things of infrastructure. So I'm just trying to project forward, but I could imagine a, a kind of a, a much larger ambition, which is like defining the, the, the landscapes, the regional landscapes that are supporting uh, people and where they live and breathe and, and, and the, the, the animals that comprise them and trying to kind of knit those together. I just feel like we can't just go on with this with this kind of property centric land centric mindset and come out where your vision is you know we need to really think differently about how we're carrying on planning urban design and infrastructure projects and I think to the point that uh, Marina and others made that has to come from the communities that it can't be visioned from the top it needs to be visioned from the communities um, would somebody else like to ask a question? There's somebody in the, oh, here we go, over here, thank you. I'm told we can, we have a few more minutes, so. <laughs> thank you. Hi, I'm Janet Bowman, and I live in the Panhandle, Florida, where there's been a, a transition from um, traditional oystermen, oyster fisheries in Apalachicola to aquaculture, and there's been a lot of community resistance from the traditional f fisher people, oystermen and women, and um, while there is an emergent aquaculture industry, it, it's a different uh, demographic of typically um, wealthier people who have the ability to invest in the equipment or, or more have more education, et cetera. It, it's more of a business than more of a traditional extractive industry to the point where Franklin County at one point banned aquaculture within the county because they viewed it as a threat. So I, I'm, I'm curious about in other parts of the country how sort of the transition from you know traditional fisheries to aquaculture and you know traditional fishermen, how that's addressed and some of the challenges. Well, the Chesapeake Bay, they're kicking and screaming too, so the <laughs> Apalachicola is not uh, not um, alone in that. Um, I think the biggest thing is, you know, so I can really only speak for, like, the Chesapeake Bay because um, I have the most experience in that. But I would say, like, you know, for our biggest challenges at the start was that aquaculture came in because our we got – hit really hard in our oyster population. Um, and so the way that it was marketed was as this like solution that was gonna replace traditional fisheries. And I think like over time that's really been a part of the narrative is that it's gonna replace like traditional fisheries. And I think that's where like some of the resistance is coming from. Um, the way that I've sort of started to see it and especially um, I actually just went to um, Hawaii and. In, in, did a whole like aquaculture uh, work trip there with like traditional um, Hawaiian communities and aquaculture. And their biggest you know thing is, especially with like blue um, ocean Mary culture, is that they started their offshore fish pens by going out into the local community and doing different 
fish types that weren't going to compete with the local traditional uh, fisheries. Um, they put it in an area where the fishermen in that in those locations weren't going to be hindered by their boats or anything like that. Um, so I think if it works if aquaculture can work together with tr traditional fisheries, um, because we need both. Um, I don't think, I mean, is it bad to say that I don't think that aquaculture is going to be like the only way that we feed our people on this planet. Um, there's, we've got to marry all these different things together. And so I think that when we start changing the narrative of aquaculture into, we're trying to have a, another avenue while also bringing in the old too and trying to make all of it sustainable, then we can start really getting people to buy into aquaculture and not having it be, well, you're trying to replace what my family's been doing for decades or what I've been doing for decades. And we've done, uh, totally agree with everything Imani said, we've also done some reframing around aquaculture as um, not other, but and. So it's it's a diversification strategy. It's something that, that traditional fisheries can adopt in their off season that they can use to be growing kelp alongside of those oysters and those clams that they've been harvesting for centuries. They can grow kelp in the winter when they are catching lobster in the summer, if they can still catch lobster in their region. So we look at it as, as you know, both and. Yeah, and I'm not sure how traditional we're talking about when you say traditional, because I'm thinking 11,000 years back. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, you know, it sounds like what's really needed are these community conversations that, that, like I was saying, how the Sustainable Southeast Partnership got started. It's not fun. It's really painful in the beginning. There are a lot of tears, especially when you're bringing up things that are really vulnerable for people. There's a lot of kicking and screaming, but if you can get people to sit down stay in the room and keep revisiting these conversations and having them, then you're able to, to share education. Usually when there's conflict, it's lack of information on somebody's part or both parties, right? And so if you're able to actually share that education and to be able to share that, look, aquaculture is not a replacement, but it's something to enhance and to tend to diversify the fisheries, then people in the communities are able to actually make informed decisions and have like an informed feeling and stance on that. And nine times out of 10, there is a consensus where people are able to meet you in the middle and it's not gonna be an all or nothing type of thing. We saw the same thing in Southeast Alaska. I'm sure we see the same thing everywhere. It's a really scary thought and you know, for indigenous people, it's a very scary thought when we're thinking about the potentially manipulating our environment, right? Especially since it's been touched so much in the recent years anyways. And so, you know, when mariculture, when kelp farming, the idea of that was popping up in Southeast Alaska, almost every tribal government said, absolutely no, we do not want this in our community. But after having conversations, there was no conversations to persuade them to, to do this in their communities, but to give them the education about what mariculture is, what could happen, with um, enhancing these kelp beds in, in our regions. And so with uh, being able to have those really hard conversations and share that education, people are able to make more informed decisions in the end. Thank you. And I, I was just gonna say, there, you, did, do you wanna add something, Kate? No. There used to be a thriving lobster fishery in Long Island Sound that no longer sure. exists. Yeah. Exactly, because yeah. of climate change um, and other things. But I think we could have one last question. I'm going to advocate for the guy in the blue. All the right, back. all right. Imani picked him. <laughs> He's going to run up. <laughs> Thanks, Imani. Appreciate it. Hey, I'm Steve, uh, coming from Alaska. So, Marina, great to see an Alaskan voice on the stage. Um, my question might be a little bit off topic, so if the gentleman's might be more relevant, we can go to that one. But um, I will be the arbiter of that. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> so I work on uh, more terrestrial projects, so reforestation projects. This is actually, Marina, you just mentioned a topic that you know, kind of relates. Um, has there been any movement, I don't know, again, it might be off topic, but where aquaculture, marine culture is kind of talking about the reforestation of certain habitats? Like, so we're talking kelp beds on the west coast of... North America, like kind of larger scale done in a, you know, yeah. inclusive, socially inclusive yeah. manner. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah, we'd love to. Yeah, I mean, we're actually doing some work with the Nature Conservancy in Humboldt Bay in cool. California. Um, as many folks here probably know, the bull kelp natural 
populated bulk help beds have been completely decimated by the purple zombie urchins. Sounds mm -hmm. like a horror film, but it's real yeah. life. Um, and so we've been using, leveraging our farm site in Humboldt Bay to do some research with TNC looking at best restoration methods, what those quantifiable impacts are from restoration projects, and like nuts and bolts stuff, like how much it costs to restore kelp beds, because those are essential things to be thinking about. So there are certainly efforts happening in California. Um, and as Jean said, there are some in the Pacific Northwest happening too. Puget Sound is doing some really amazing restoration work. Yeah, and in fact, um, I'm, I'm on the board of the Alaka Alliance in Oregon, which is trying to restore sea otters to the Oregon coast because they are integral to the kelp restoration. So that's that's another thing that's happening. And I'm sure there's happening. Kate's going to add something. No, I, oh, okay. I, I was just going to say, I mean, your question points to the interconnectedness of all things, right? And I, that's why, for me, this unit of landscape that's inclusive of people that is inclusive of the water in the cloud to the, you know, the seas around us, that it's the same water. And, and you know, I, I, I do feel like, you know, beginning to think across these seemingly disparate, you know, realms of things is, is, is absolutely critical. So there's no, there's no um, healthy river without an intact forest uh, adjacent to it where the roots of that forest are really part of the river. Um, so, you know, without getting too, <laughs> too off topic, but I, I do feel like thinking more around these systems and cycles and physical landscapes that are about the interconnectedness of us and, and the world that now, frankly, cannot sadly exist outside of our, our active cultivation um, is, is, is a great way to go. That is the perfect way to wrap Great this question. up. The interconnectedness yeah. of all of this and all of us. Um, I feel uh, so grateful to have had this conversation with the four of you. It was amazing. And um, thank you, everybody who joined us. And uh, I think that is a wrap for us. But I am really, really appreciative of your time here today. Thank you. Thank you.